I couldn't be there in person. Adi Purush Prabhu, I was meant to be, but um, I was not able. Uh, so today we are speaking um, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, verse 2. Uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 13. So I will read the verse and then we will chant our prayers. Huh? So let me share my screen for those that are able to do that. And the verse says, Garba sankarshanatam vai prahu sankarshanam bhuvi Rameti loka ramanad balabadram balochrayat. And I'll just read the translation and the purport. So the translation says the son of Rohini will also be celebrated as Sankarshana because of being sent from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini. He will be called Rama because of his ability to please all the inhabitants of Gokul. And he will be known as Balabhadra because of his extensive physical strength. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada says, These are some of the reasons why Balaram is known as Sankarsana, Balaram, or sometimes Rama. In the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. People sometimes object when Rama is accepted as Balaram. But although devotees of Lord Rama may object, they should know that there is no difference between Balaram and Lord Ram. Here, Srimad Bhagavatam clearly states that Balaram is also known as Rama, Rameti. Therefore, it is not artificial for us to speak of Lord Balaram as Lord Ram. Jayadev Goswami also speaks of three Ramas, Parashuram, Raghupati Ram, and Balaram. All of them are Ramas. Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam ki Jai. So I will, um, we can chant our, our prayers together. Uh, please bless me that I'll be able to speak something of, of use and in line with Parampara. Hmm. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Chalakaya Chakshur Unmilitham Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam, Shtapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupak Hadamayam, Dadati Swapadantikam, Vandeham Shri Gurum, Shri Gurum Vaishnavamscha, Shri, Shri Yuta Padakamalam, Shri Gurum Vaishnavamscha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatham Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalitam Shri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandhu Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostute, Tapta Kanchana Gorangi, Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye. Vancha kalpa tarubhyascha, kripa sindubhya evacha, patitanam bhavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namo namaha. Nama om vishnu padaya krishna prishtaya bhutale, shrimate bhakti vedanta swamini tinamine. Namaste saraswate deve, gauravani pracharine. 
निर्विशेषाशून्यवादि पाश्चात्य देश तारिने जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यनंद श्री अद्वैता गदाधरा श्री वासादी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Like I said originally please please um pray for me that I may be able to speak something of use and in line with Guru Parampara um and thank you for all of you for all your wonderful blessed devotees for being here specifically thank you to um Adi Purush Prabhu Arjuna Prabhu please bless me that I can speak something nicely and uh I'll just read this um this uh let me pull up my notes i'll just read this translation um again so the translation is speaking about lord balaram uh this verse is speaking about lord balaram uh the son of rohini will also be celebrated as sankarshana because of being sent from the womb of devaki to the womb of rohini he will be called ram because of his ability to please all the inhabitants of gokula and he will be known as balabhadra because of his extensive physical strength so uh in this verse um there's uh many directions that one can go in and uh i was when i was preparing to give this class i was needing some some help <laughs> because i didn't know which direction to go in there's so many directions to go in and i felt um that i didn't necessarily want to speak about balaram leela because they didn't feel qualified to do so <laughs> so i wanted to do, um go in a different direction and i heard this wonderful lecture by anutama prabhu who is a shri prabhu disciple um about this verse and uh, i really liked that he focused in on a word and a, a mood that shri prabhu pad was highlighting in the purport so in the purport shri prabhu pad saying is that people sometimes object when ram is accepted as balaram hmm? and shri prabhupad uses this word twice actually uh he says although the devotees of lord ram may object right he uses this word object a second time they should know that there is no difference between balaram and lord ram so it's clear that shri prabhupad is focusing in on this fact that um some people are objecting about the names of god essentially right some people are saying no lord ram 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 is the correct name of god right i'm sure many of us have had this experience maybe when we're speaking about the hari krishna mantra to others especially others like in the yoga world um or in the or in the vedic world who know lord ram they're like you mean lord ram right it's like no yeah no kind of both right this is sometimes our answer but it's balaram it's also ram it's also krishna right and they're like no 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 it's ram <laughs> so um this word object to object it's it's quite the word actually like if we think about it and we think about kind of the the world that we're living in there's so much objection going on actually right there's so much um uh opinions and so much criticism from 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 either sides of the extreme no these are the names of god no actually this is the name of god no this is the correct stance no actually this is the correct stance no this is the correct politics to have no actually this is the correct politics to have right our country is best no our country is best right and we could go on and on forever right this is the nature of material world and of the dualities of the material world and it's very clear to us from this verse from shri prabhupad's purport from our understanding of guru parampara that this is actually not the correct understanding right and so lord chaitanya is telling us in the shikshastakam uh something very clear he is telling us in the beautiful shikshastakam that it is the only uh writing that shri chaitanya left to us he says nam nam akari bahudha 
Nija Sarva Shakti, Tatra Pita Niyamita, Smarane Nakala, Etadrishita Vakripa Bhagavan Mamapi, Dur Daivam Idrisham Ihajani Nanuraga. That, oh my Lord, you have invested um, all of your energies, right? Sarva Shaktis, you've invested all of your energies into your holy names. And you have many names, unlimited names, right? Bahudha, unlimited names like Krishna and Govinda, um, by which you expand yourself, yes? And uh, we won't get into this so much, but it's such a beautiful sentiment, Sri Chaitanya is saying, and, 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 you've, and you've made it so easy to chant these names, but still I have no attraction, right? Still I have no attraction. To chanting and actually it's it's a good thing that i mentioned that last part of the verse because it's really interesting instead of diving deeper into our attraction for the holy names when we're on the material platform we get caught in this plane of our objections yes no it should be chanted in this way or it should be chanted in this place or it should only be chanted like this right or no you should only chant ram don't don't chant krishna Right. <laughs> so instead of getting absorbed by the names, even Sri Chaitanya is expressing his humility. Right. I have no I have no attachment. Instead of doing this, uh, we get so caught up on the material platform, on the objections that we have. Right. It should be like this. No, it should be like this. And so we are being told here already that God has many names. Right. Sri Chaitanya himself is telling us um, that God has many names. But. It is very difficult um, for people to accept this actually, right? When we're able to drop into the plane of the, of the soul, we're able to see, yes, it's, it's all one God, it all makes sense, right? And um, Bhakti is, um, I'm just seeing if this message is for me. Oh, this is for others. <laughs> Jai, thank you, Andrea. Um, so yes, we are already seeing that Lord Chaitanya is telling us that God has many names, but when we're on the material platform, it's very difficult to understand that. So when we come to bhakti, and oftentimes we hear as bhakti, bhakti as being non-sectarian, right? Bhakti is non-sectarian. And the understanding here, this is such a wonderful purport and such a wonderful sentiment from Srila Prabhupada and the purport and Sri Chaitanya's teachings that really drive this point home of non-sectarianism right that we're understanding that it is it is one god and that god has many names right sri chaitanya is saying himself and actually sri chaitanya is giving this example the the lived experience of sri chaitanya so we know of sri anupam and for those of you that don't know who sri anupam is sri anupam is the brother of um sanatan goswami and rupa goswami and he is the father of jiva goswami and Sri Anupam was a Ram devotee. And Lord Chaitanya did not tell Anupam, no, what is this nonsense? You must chant Krishna, only Krishna's names, right? Only Krishna is the best. No, this is not what Lord Chaitanya did. Lord Chaitanya saw that Sri Anupam in his heart had Ram, and that he was truly a devotee of Ram. And therefore, Lord Chaitanya reciprocated with him in the mood of Ram. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing uh, not only Lord Chaitanya's instruction in Shikshastakam, but also his lived example of how he treated um, Sri Anupam. And this is very interesting because in one way, in one sense, we're seeing the example and we're seeing the instruction and even uh, Sri Chaitanya is, is, is telling us this, Srila Prabhupada is telling us this, and we've heard it so many times, right? We've heard it so many times, but there is a problem here. <laughs> And the problem is that we object, right? <laughs> the problem is that we have objections towards this. And not only towards this, but towards many things, right? And there's a simple uh, truth as to why we can't understand this or why we fall into objecting and uh, criticizing and opining about so many things in this world, not just the names of God, those are the most important, but all the little minuscule things as well. We're objecting, we have so many back and forths. And uh, um, this is given to us in Bhagavad Gita, chapter seven. Um, 
it is saying that we are I, we are deluded by the material modes of nature, right? And Krishna is telling uh, Arjuna that the whole world does not know me um, because I am above the material modes and I am inexhaustible. And this is very, very interesting. This is Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 13, right? Tribir guna mayar bhavir. And this is very interesting because something I've always liked about bhakti philosophy, I, I grew up um, in a Christian religion. I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. And it was really interesting. I'll try not to go off too much into a tangent, but it was really interesting growing up as a Jehovah's Witness um, because from a very young age, I was told in, in our religion that God has a name and that that name is Jehovah, right? Because the, the word God is not actually a name of God. It's actually a quite quite a recent historical um, thing. I won't speak too much about it because I, I'm not a historian, but I know for a fact that it's, it's quite a recent historical phenomenon in terms of language, right? God is not a, a name of God. So if you go into the Bible, the names of God are Yahweh or Jehovah, right? And so I grew up with this concept of like, yeah, name of God, right? This is the name of God. And uh, it's really interesting that we become deluded or the mind becomes deluded oh wait i was going to make a point sorry so when i grew up in this religion what became really interesting to me or what started to feel very off is that they were saying this is the only name of god this is the only name of god and only this name of god is correct so allah incorrect demonic right or krishna incorrect wrong demonic right and so especially when I started to be a teenager, I was like, this doesn't feel right. Like something feels wrong. I, it, I, was, I grew up in New York City. So I saw such a plethora of difference, right? So many different people from different religions, from different cultures, from all over the world. And I started to really feel like intuitively that there must be something wrong with this teaching. How, how can Jehovah be right, but Krishna and Allah and all these other wonderful names of God be wrong. Something must be amiss here. And so now comes this verse, Bhagavad Gita 713. I, I, what I was really attracted to um, by Bhakti philosophy and Krishna, what Krishna is saying in, in Bhagavad Gita is that he kind of levels the playing field, right? He kind of levels the playing field. He says, we are all affected by the gunas. We are all caught in the material world. We are all um, caught in the system of karma, right? The whole world, right, is deluded. The whole world does not know me. And it's humbling. It's very, very humbling. And we go back to the Shikshastakam where even Lord Chaitanya himself is saying, and I have no attraction for your names. And so we're seeing Sri Chaitanya's level of humility and his example, really, and so for us to get on the material platform and, and um, get self-righteous sometimes, no, I know. No, no, no. This, this is the name of God. This is how you should chant, actually. This is the only way to chant. This is the only name of God and like this, right? Then this can become quite dangerous, actually, because it is creating a culture of sectarianism. Yes, it is creating a culture of sectarianism. And uh, it is creating a divisive culture. And bhakti is a culture of non-sectarianism, right? Bhakti is a philosophy and a culture where we are trying to, um, of course, align ourselves more towards a sattvic mood, but eventually understanding that all the gunas um, have their attachments and their bindings. And we are trying to get out of the gunas. We are trying to get out of this material world, right? We are trying to go back to Godhead. We are trying to, we are trying to do that. That is our endeavor, right? <laughs> though, though it might be some time, at least for me, I can say that, <laughs> but that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> and so something very interesting here is that um, when we are in a community of people that are really practicing this and are really living this, it is, it is, uh, it is really hope giving, right? I think that's why so many of us are attracted to the Bhakti Center, right? The Bhakti Center has very much a mood of non-sectarianism, 
when you go to Thursday night Kirtan at the Bhakti Center, you see people from all walks of life, from all over the world, from all colors, from all, all places, right? All, all genders, everything, everything in, under the sun. And you see this beautiful room of people from all over the world. Um, I remember when Jai Girid Hari uh, used to host the Thursday night Kirtan, he would always ask, who came from the farthest? right? Who came from the farthest? And some people would be like, I came from Africa and I came from Australia and I came from Russia and I can, I just got off a plane two days ago from Australia, right? Like this is really happening. And so New York is such a wonderful melting pot of all of these different cultures, different religions, different ways of approaching the divine. Yet when the seeker is truly, truly uh, searching for, for Krishna, they they will be attracted, right? And I feel like the Thursday night kirtan is such a testament to that because all these people from different walks of life, of life are coming together to chant Krishna's names. It's so wonderful. So um, the question becomes now. So we've covered a few things, right? Um, we're understanding that uh, Shri Prabhupada is denoting that there's no difference between Ram and Balaram and Raghupati Ram, right? And Parashuram, right? These are all expansions of Krishna. These are all names of God. In his purport, he's mentioning that there are sometimes objections about this by the devotees of Lord Ramachandra even, right? There are some objections. No, why are you chanting like this? Ram is better, right? And we went to Sri Chaitanya's example of saying, Nam Nam Akari Bahudhani Jasad of Shaktis, right? All of your potencies are in all of these names and you have unlimited names. And even Sri Chaitanya's example of Sri Anupam and how he treated him and how he reciprocated with him in, Lord, in the mood of Lord Ram, right? And then I mentioned this verse of Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 7, verse 13 about the whole world being deluded by the modes of nature and not knowing Krishna. And therefore this is the problem, right? This is the problem. So then the question of course is, well, how do we get out of this delusion, right? If we are deluded by material nature, then of course the question, and, and because of that reason, I am, in, I am thrown to either extreme of objections, right? So many objections. No, this is correct. No, that is correct. And we'll get more into that later. But if this is the problem, then, of course, the question is, how do we get out of delusion? Right? How do we get out of delusion? And this is a very important question. And, of course, we have our, our standard answers. Well, we take to the processes of bhakti. We take shelter, right? We, we, we come to sangha, right? Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. I know I'm usually not. We're not supposed to do this, but I'm just gonna eh, I'm gonna skip to the next verse just a tiny bit. I won't go into the verse, I won't go into the meaning, I promise, but just something from the purport is so powerful. The next verse is talking about the Vedic injunctions. Om, right? It's talking about the Vedic injunctions or the Vedic scriptures, the scriptures. And I really like Srila Prabhupada here is saying in the purport, it is a fact that whatever is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead is a Vedic injunction that no one should neglect. Hmm. In Vedic injunctions, there are no mistakes, illusions, cheating, or imperfection. Hmm. Unless one understands the authority of the Vedic version, there is no purpose in quoting Shastra. No one should violate the Vedic injunctions. Rather, one should strictly execute the orders given in the Vedas. I really, really love that Prabhupada is so heavy here, right? Because we're understanding that the way to actually get out of this delusion, there, it's twofold, actually. One is understanding that the Vedic injunction and that everything that the Supreme Personality of Godhead says is, is truth. There are no mistakes. There's no illusion, right? True Prabhupada is saying. And the other, right, there's two injunctions in this purport. One is understanding that fact. And the other is um, being able to understand the, the Vedic uh, version, the scriptures, right? Because if one can't understand what it is saying, then Srila Prabhupada clearly states, then there's no purpose in quoting Shastra, right? 
You can just quote Shastra and quote Shastra and quote Shastra, but not have a true understanding. I remember the last time I gave class, I won't go so much in this story because I have a lot of other stories that I want to share and limited time. But I remember the last time and I was actually rereading this story. I heard it and then I read, I read it. But um, Srila Rednath Swami was speaking about how once a, he was uh, visiting some, some I, I can't remember if he was visiting a college town or exactly where he was. But anyway, uh, Srila Radhanath Swami was giving a lecture and a college professor came to him who was expert in, uh, had all these PhDs in uh, Hindu um, religion and Vedic philosophy and, and a specialty and a specialty in Krishna philosophy. Um, uh, but Krishna was not in his heart. Right. So he came to Radhanath Swami and he said, how is it that you are worshiping Krishna? Like, I, I know Krishna. I studied him. I spent all my years studying him. And Krishna, why Krishna? Why Krishna among all the other gods that are out there? You know, Krishna is mischievous. Krishna is a thief. Krishna is, a, you know, uh, is uh, just running around with all these uh, gopis. Like, what is this? You know, why are you worshiping this god? And uh, I won't go too much into the story. Radhanath Swami gave many, many explanations. And then it became very clear that the college professor um, was not really interested and had to go because his wife was calling him. Um, but <laughs> at the end of the day, we're understanding, right, that if you're not really, right, actually, I will go into it. What Srila Naradhanath Swami told him, just in a, in a nutshell, I don't want to get into the story too much, is, have you read, he asked him, have you read Bhagavad Gita chapter two? And the, and the, and the professor was like, no. Right? And Radhanath Swami basically told him, like, you need to kind of go about this in a, in a systematic way. You can't just jump to Ras Lila. You can't just jump to Krishna Lila. You have to go about things in a systematic way for you to really, really understand who is Krishna and why we worship him. Right. And so the college professor thought that this was bogus and he just left. But the, the, the point here is that we really have to. Uh, respect the authority of the Vedic understanding, but also understand what the scripture is trying to tell us in the first place. And to be able to do that, right, to be able to do that, um, something, a humble state is necessary, right? Because with humility, we have to understand that we need to hear. We need to hear, actually. And that's why hearing um, is uh, one of the, the main processes of bhakti yoga, right? And hearing is, uh, is, is, is given more importance than reading. Hmm. Because when we read, uh, we are reading through our, not that reading isn't important. Of course, you should read Bhagavatam and read scripture every day, of course, 100%. But hearing is more important. And why? Because when we are reading, we are reading through our, our lens of experience and our lens of um, maya that is affecting us in this moment, right? We're reading, it's, it's being sifted, right? You can think of the mind as like a sieve, right? And so the, the Vedic instruction is being sifted through our mind. And if our mind is clogged with so many opinions and objections and this and whatever are anarthas, right? Then we are going to understand it the way that we want to understand it. And that's why more importance is given to hearing because we are hearing from the sadhu, right? We are hearing from the guru and we are trying our best to dive into the understandings of these Vedic injunctions through their, um, uh, through their uh, explanations and their purports, right? So this is a very important point that the Vedic scriptures are there to help us get out of the delusion of the material modes so that we are not on the platform of uh, objecting, comparing and contrasting. Um, however, we need Guru Parampara to help us do that, right? And uh, the reason, right, there's this verse that I really like. It says, Tasmad Guru Prapadyata Shreya Jignyasu Shreya Uttamam Shabde Pare Chanishnatam Brahmani Upashamashrayam. Right? Uh, we are understanding that the qualifications of a guru, right? There are so many verses that are speaking about the qualifications of a guru, but this one I very much like is from Srimad Bhagavatam, um, 11th chapter, uh, 11th canto, sorry. 
And it is saying that a person who desires to know about the ultimate transcendent uh, reality, right, uh, has to take shelter of a bona fide guru, right? So if you want to know, right, if you want to know about Sri Krishna, if you want to know about all the names of God, if you want to know about all these wonderful transcendent realities, then you must take shelter of the bona fide guru. And what are the qualifications of the guru? It says that he is fully, he has fully realized the purport of all Vedic scriptures. Hmm. So this is very important, right? This is what we're talking about. He has fully realized the purport of all Vedic scriptures. So not just quoting Shastra here and there, but the purport, the true meaning, right? For someone who has truly understood the purport of all Vedic scriptures, and we see it, we see it in our, in our, in our gurus and in, in, in the saints in our lineage, we see it, right? They are not pointing fingers and saying, ah, look at them. They're chanting incorrectly. This name of God is not valid, right? They're, they're, they're not saying like this, right? They are saying like Sri Chaitanya to, to Sri Anupam, right? No, okay, I will reciprocate with you in the mood of Lord Ram. And this is a very beautiful, very beautiful example. Uh, the second qualification of Sri Guru is he has full realization of the absolute truth, right? Um, Sri Krishna Bhagavan. And uh, this is very important, right? They have uh, full realization. And lastly, that they are completely free from material desire and attachments. <laughs> and I'm laughing because it's just such a, it's just such a reminder of, oh yeah, that's right. I am not free of uh, material desire and attachments. I do not have full realization of the supreme absolute truth. I do not know or <laughs> have not fully realized the purport of all Vedic scriptures. <laughs> so it's, it's humbling. And Srila Prabhupada often likes to say this, that um, we have to know our position, right? We have to know our position. This is one of my favorite Srila Prabhupada-isms, right? That we have to know our position. Because if we know our position truly and humbly, then I understand that I need to take shelter of the Guru. And I understand that I need to understand, I need to hear the purport of Vedic scriptures from sadhu, right? And that I'm not going to go off into my own um, ideations of what is right and what is not right. Because this is more, this is moralizing from a material standpoint, and um, that can get quite messy. So um, I heard this uh, story of Srila Prabhupada that I really liked. I was listening to a lecture and I heard this story that I'll share with all of you. So Srila Prabhupada was in Tehran, Iran, many years ago. And uh, he was with the devotees there. And the devotees were explaining to Srila Prabhupada that they would go out and do Harinam in the streets. And that sometimes they were chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra um, when they would do the Harinam. And sometimes they were also chanting the names of Allah. And Srila Prabhupada's response was, um, this is very nice. Yeah, this is very nice. Good. And the devotees then asked Srila Prabhupada um, as to which name was better. Was Krishna's name better or was Allah's name better? And Srila Prabhupada said, you can't differentiate the names of God. Right? You can't differentiate the names of God. And the devotees kept pushing. They were like, no, Srila Prabhupada, we really want to know which names are better, Krishna or Allah, because we're going out, we're doing Harinam, we're chanting both names, but we want to know which one is better. Because the sense, these are devotees asking Srila Prabhupada. So the idea is that it's kind of rhetorical. They want Srila Prabhupada to say, nah, Krishna's names are better, right? You get that feeling. And Srila Prabhupada's response after they push was, why are you trying to make me sectarian? Mm. And this is, such a, this is such a beautiful example that Srila Prabhupada is giving us. Why are you trying to make me sectarian? Mm. Because the understanding is, is, is that we are not trying to position ourselves as, as better, right? And this gets really ugly. I'll try not to go too much into the negative, but it gets really ugly, even in our own devotional communities, right? Oh, look at those karmis over there, right? Ugh, terrible people, awful, right? And um, 
I'm sorry, it was a little bit of lag, but I think we're back. Um, and we do this in our devotional community. Um, we unfortunately get into this state with other devotees, and this is very dangerous. We won't get so much into the effects of this, but Vaishnav Aparad is, is, the, is the height of, uh, uh, of how our devotional life can become ruined, actually, and how Sri Krishna can take away um, his mercy. And so if we are committing Vaishnava Aparad, then um, we won't make progress in our bhakti. What is, what is Vaishnava Aparad, Kishore Chandra? Uh, Vaishnava can, you, can, you give us, can you give us some examples? Sure. I'll give a simple example. It's, 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 it's speaking uh, in a defamatory way towards another Vaishnava or another bhakti yogi, right? So criticizing another uh, person who is practicing bhakti or speaking ill of them or making any sort of offenses uh, towards any other Vaishnava. And it's quite a high standard, right? Because you think about it, you think about it, and it's quite easy to criticize or make offenses to people, right? If you think about how mundane society works, right? People are always gossiping. And when you're gossiping, you're talking about, oh, this person did this and they did, oh, I can't believe they did like this. And oh my God, who do they think they are? They did this, what are, you know, like this, right? This is often how the conversation is going. And oftentimes criticism comes out, how could they do this? You know, how, who, what, right? And so we have to be very careful, one, to speak about mundane topics and two, to criticize other devotees. Is it, it can really cause um, uh, uh, a fall down in our, a reversal in our Krishna consciousness and our bhakti. And when we are on this material platform, then we are going to be asking these questions. Oh, which is better, Ram or Bala? Which is better, Ram or Allah? Which is better, Krishna or Allah, right? And if that is the case, right? If we're starting from this sanctimonious uh, place of, 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 of objecting about the names of God, then that behavior is going to trickle down into every aspect of our life. And we're seeing now a days that we live in a very divisive time. We're living in Kali Yuga. And I'm not going to get too much into it because I don't want to bring up too many hot topics because that's not the point of <laughs> Srimad Bhagavatam class. But just as an example, we are seeing in the world that we live in all the objections going on, right? No, we should, the US should go to war. No, they shouldn't, right? And these two sides are fighting. Black Lives Matter? No, they don't, right? And these two sides are fighting. Uh, vaccine? No vaccine. And these two sides are fighting. LGBT? No LGBT. These two sides are fighting, right? And so we are seeing this constant fight in society of who is right. Hmm. And the real understanding here is that um, no one is right. <laughs> I'm going to pull up a verse. Let me see if I can find it. It's one of my favorite verses, and I feel that it will speak to this. Let's see if I can find it. The real understanding is that no one is right and that we should take shelter of um, uh, Sri Krishna, that we should do what Sri Prabhupada is telling us here. We should take uh, shelter of the guru and understand the scriptures, not just by our material understandings, but by... Um, by understanding the true purport. And the true purport is that all of these practices are supposed to be making our hearts soft like butter so that Krishna can steal our hearts, right? Not hard, right? Not hard. This is, I found the verse. There's this wonderful verse, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam chapters, uh, Canto 6, chapter 4, verse 31. It says, let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the all-pervading supreme personality of Godhead who possesses unlimited transcendental qualities Acting from within the cores of the hearts of all philosophers, he propagates um, various views. He causes them to forget their own souls while sometimes agreeing and sometimes disagreeing among themselves. Thus, he creates within this material world a situation in which they are unable to come to a conclusion. Hmm. I offer my obeisances unto him. This is one of my favorite verses <laughs> about this topic specifically, just because it's clear. Yeah, we're just going to, if we're on this material platform, we're just going to continuously 
be fighting about who is right, right? And we're being, view, we're being told very clearly in the message of Srimad Bhagavatam that we have to get off of the platform of I and mine, right? This is, this is actually Maya, this is actually illusion. And rather, um, uh, Sri Prahlad speaks about this so much, right? Uh, Prahlad Maharaj speaks about this so much um, that we need to move off of this platform of, of friend and enemy, right? Oh, they're, they're the enemy, they're wrong. Their names of God are nonsense, right? So if we are actually approaching our spiritual life like this, it's very dangerous, right? It's very dangerous because we are hardening the heart as opposed to softening the heart. And um, we are also wanting to understand, I'll end with this point because I wanna leave time for questions, but I thought that this was a really beautiful point. I have a few more points, but uh, let's see if I can make it through. Um, but uh, this was another story. Um, I was listening to this lecture, like I was saying of Anutama Prabhu, and he was, he was saying that um, um, a Canadian devotee told him this story about how in Canada, some devotees who were opening a Govinda's restaurant, they called the Canadian government and they were trying to register legally the name of Govinda. They were trying to register legally the name of Govinda. And this government clerk in Canada said, no, you can't do that. You can't register the name of Govinda. And the devotee was like, why not? We're, this is Govinda. And the clerk lady, right? This is a government clerk. She said, you can't register a name of God. You can't do that. <laughs> and I really loved that because the idea is that is that God owns his names, right? God owns his names, right? And we are trying our best through this process of bhakti to um, become soft-hearted so that we can enter into the, the deep, uh, uh, um, the deep uh, understanding and communion, that's the word, communion with these names. Because many of us, um, uh, one, this ownership of God's names, right? We don't own God's name. God owns his own names, right? And so when we are entering into our japa practice or our mantra practice, um, it doesn't make us, you know, better than other people. And this is something really, if I can leave you all with something, you know, I remember when I first moved into the ashram, maybe I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but I'll just put, my, put myself out there. You know, when you first move into the ashram, you're like, I'm giving up everything and I'm, you know, living this very simple lifestyle now. And, you know, you kind of get this um, little bit of, they, they call it pure devotee syndrome, right? This little high and mightiness of just like, <laughs> I'm a little better, right? Oh, I've given up everything. I'm chanting Hare Krishna. Look at these karmis, you know? <laughs> and this is not the understanding, right? Because I remember, I can't remember who, who said it, maybe it was, um, ma many people have said this, but, but we're in the ashram not because we're better, but actually because we, we are the most fallen and we need so much help and we need so much guidance and we're taking to, to this, this process of devotional service and, and we need the guidance and we need the shelter of the ashram. And so we shouldn't be on this material platform where just because we're thinking, oh, we have Krishna's names, we're better than other people. Um, because many of us also, I mean, okay, I won't say many of us. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use I statements. I sometimes, and um, we are approaching this name, Nam, Nam, Nam Aparad. So there are levels of chanting the name and I'll explain it too. Um, so I won't get too much into this, but there are levels of chanting, right? And so Nam Aparad is you're making offenses right? There's 10 offenses to chanting the names of Krishna. And one of the offenses is chanting inattentively. And how many of us, uh, you don't have to answer this question, are chanting inattentively, right? I, I, chant. I, I chant like that. I chant like that. <laughs> and, so, and so I'll end here um, with the main message of, of understanding that there are many names of God and we have to humble ourselves to understand that uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in this tradition uh, seeking shelter and not trying to uh, place ourselves above other people and not trying to object towards other people's understandings. 
um, because that actually will dig a hole deeper into the material world. I'll end here and I'll, I'll take uh, questions or comments or corrections, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kishore Chandra Prabhu. Uh, we have Jamuna Jaya and Shikshashtakam Prabhu raising their hands. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Kishore Chandra. Wonderful class. Thank you. You spoke on one of my favorite topics um, about um, the non-sectarianism, sectarianism. And whenever I think about it, I think about, and I ran to my bookshelf to pull it out. Um, Radhanath Maharaj speaks of it so perfectly in The Journey Within. And I just want to, because I, whenever I try to explain Bhakti, I use this definition. It's such a well-worn book uh, where he says, um, uh, the word Bhakti means unconditional love for the Supreme Being and deep compassion for others. This love is so complete that inspires love not only for God, but for everyone and everything connected to him. In other words, bhakti is expressed in a dynamic, practical way by our loving God, showing kindness to others and caring for the environment, knowing that it's God's sacred energy, essential to the well-being of all life. And here he, here he, he gets it. Bhakti is also the name of a path of yoga dedicated to awakening this love within us. It is not a practice exclusive to any particular religion or creed. It is the essence of all religions and creeds because it's the natural condition of the soul. Mm. And when you're speaking, I thought, yep, that's that's it. So thank you so much because it's such a powerful reminder. Thank you. Jamuna Jaya, thank you for your contribution. Yeah, bhakti is the essence of all religions. And I have a question for Jamuna Jaya. Who's that deity behind you, Jamuna Jaya? Who's that? Uh Oh, and that, that's uh, one of my one of my many Hanumans. <laughs> cool. cool. I've, got, I've got a bunch of them all over the house. <laughs> nice, nice. I was reading uh, Srila Prabhupada's Lilamrita yesterday, and uh, the first devotees at 26 Second Avenue, they had uh, they had had some pictures from India, and uh, they had a Hanuman picture that they put uh, to surprise Prabhupada to please him. One of the first um, decorations uh, that they put in the temple was. Hanuman's picture, and uh, but they they didn't know who, who he was, so he thought they thought that he was a cat because of his upper lip. <laughs> they thought Hanuman was a cat, perhaps he was a cat. So, <laughs> but I just wanted to throw that out there. Shikshash to Kampubu, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, I like your example about feeling a little bit proud when you first become a devotee. My spiritual master in 1966, he when he became a devotee, he asked Prabhupada. So, Prabhupada, should I give everything up? And Prabhupada just kind of chuckled and he said, what do you have to give up? We don't have anything. And uh, also the other thing that you were saying, like everybody has their particular opinion. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're all wrong, you know. That's a good point because only there's only one, just like, you know, there's a saying, I'm not going to, I'm going to put this kind of delicately. You know, there are nine orifices of the body, nine gates, the city of nine gates. And opinions are like one of those gates. <laughs> Everybody has one. And uh, so Krishna's opinion, the opinion of the disciplic succession, those are the ones that we're repeating and um, just channeling and, and trying to serve others by spreading according to their will. Uh, but it's, it's funny, you know, like Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he said, you know, as far as the names and comparing this and that, you know, it, it says you shouldn't compare yourself with other people um, because that makes you vain. Mm -hmm. And also uh, Bhaktivinoda said you shouldn't like try to, well, to speak of the names, you shouldn't try to compare your own guru or your own leader to other people's leaders because he says that creates calumny. Mm -hmm. Calumny, the Dictionary definition is uh, a false or malicious statement designed to injure the injure the reputation of someone or something. So um, it just one more thing. It just reminded me of I saw a movie in the '90s called The Seventh Sign. It was like the apocalypse, you know, the seven uh, things of Revelation. And it was this Jewish kid, and all these things were coming down out of the sky. And and uh, he was talking to his rabbi, and he said. You know, comparing the different religions, everyone think, thinks that he's right. And uh, and then he just turned to the rabbi and said, what if we're all wrong? You know, and, uh, you know, and then he thought to himself, he said, what if it's just the Hare Krishnas? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's actually in the movie. But, uh, you know, 
hopefully the Hare Krishnas can be representatives and we don't have our own opinions, you know, because as soon as it, you think of you have an opinion, that's immediately tied to the Dharma, you know, cheating religion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Kishore Chandra Prabhu, there's a question in the chat hmm. from Angel. Yes, please speak a moment on the differences between criticism and correction of other devotees, especially those like children, spouses, or students when one is a teacher. Yes, this is okay. That's fine. Um, so we're understanding that we um, come into uh, our relationships with different devotees is different, right? And so it, it's said that we should always have Actually, for a healthy spiritual life, we should always have it is said, those above us that we are uh, that we are seeking shelter in, right? Our 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 gurus and our shiksha gurus and our mentors. We should have peers, um, uh, our, our people who are are devotionally spiritually going through a, a similar process as us, or we're on the same playing field, right? Peers that we can speak with and and speak our heart with and and go through. And we should also have people junior to us, right? People that we are teaching, whether they be students or children um, like this. So yes, this is, this is not a, a criticism when you are correcting children. I don't think that that's a, a Vaishnava apparat <laughs> or students. Um, but I do, like, I do like in here that you included spouses <laughs> um, because that's a whole different ballpark. <laughs> Um, I think spouses is a, a little different. You can definitely commit um, this offense towards a devotee uh, with a spouse because the spouse in essence um, should be somewhat your peer, right? Um, and you're taking care of each other in, in, in various ways, um, but there should be utmost respect um, in any sort of spousal relationship. Um, and I think that uh, we don't need to get into this so much, but uh, at least in my experience, in my experience in, in relationship, um, it's clear to me that the more I take shelter of the material energy, the more likely I am to commit some sort of aparad um, because I am being attacked by that energy that's moving me into rajas, moving me into tamas, right? Into passion and ignorance. And I concur, I concur. Yeah. Same experience. Yeah. And the, the more that I take shelter with my partner of Krishna and of, 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 of Bhagavatam and of, of, of spiritual activities, it will go down. And these uh, opportunities for Aparad will, will also go down. So that's my, I hope that's okay. Uh, we have something. Adipusha Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the very important question Angel is asking about the difference between criticism and offering, you know, the mood is a, the mood is a service and love and for the benefit of the other one. And we're only speaking about the principle. Like sometimes somebody would say, oh, Prabhupada, you see, he said, I'm not saying. Krishna says, right? And this is really an interesting topic about the variety, how wonderful is how wonderful is Krishna that he provides so many varieties of ways of relating to him. Everyone has a different fingerprint, even identical twins. You know, every snowflake, even though there's billions of snowflakes, if you look at them under the microscope, each one is beautiful, but each one is uniquely designed. So there's there's uniqueness in in the in a creation, and every person, every person, even within each tradition. Every person has a unique relationship with Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada explains it very carefully in the second canto. There's a, a, one purport where he's talking about the offenses to the holy name. And he said, there is no bar for anyone in any part of the creation to chant the name for the Supreme that is most uh, familiar to them and to think that they won't be benefiting as much as chanting Hare Krishna is an offense to the holy name. Yeah. And we know when Krishna came into the wrestling arena, people saw him differently. The, the, the yogis saw him as the absolute truth. The mother Jasoda saw him as her child. The gopis saw him as his, their beautiful boy next door. So 
somebody's cell phone's going off. We don't know who that is. I think it's Angel. No, mine's different. Okay, so um, the point is that everybody has a unique way of relating to Krishna, and we can respect that, and respect that, and appreciate that, um, and and um, allow for that variety because Krishna is so wonderful. Mm. That was, thank you for bringing up that purport. That's such a beautiful purport. Um, and, and thank you for bringing up this idea of, of correcting in the mood of service, because I think that that's very, that's very important to Angel's question as well, that if we're correcting someone in the mood of service, it I feel like it really has to do with our intention. And if we are trying to serve the greater whole, which is Krishna, and I'm doing it with an intention of, 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 of service, of compassion, of, of kindness, then this is okay. But how, but you know, how many times are we correcting someone because we want to be right, actually, or we think we know what's best, right? And then this is on the mood of the ego. So I'm thinking like, we're not I, saying, I know what's best. We're saying, first, we preamble and say, would you like to know what scripture says? Exactly. And exactly. then we tell them like that, right? Exactly. This is, this is the correct this is the correct way and the correct understanding. What does scripture say? What does Krishna say? What does guru say? Not, I know what's best to do like this. Yeah. Um, Andrea, Andrea, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just, uh, hi Krishna Kishore Chantra Das Prabhu. I just want to reflect back that the, my takeaway from this class that I really loved is when you said how uh, every, all bhakti practices should be making our hearts soft like butter so that Krishna can steal it. And I just felt like that was such a beautiful, just, just a beautiful image that really kind of encompasses like the, your whole class. And I just love the idea of like this little baby Krishna that he's just asking us, he's like, please just make your hearts soft like butter. I just want to steal it. And it just, it's so personal and it's so loving and it's, it's really encouraging us to have that compassion. So thank you so much for sharing that. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Angel um, Krishna, steal my butter heart. <laughs> yes. Vrajvihari <laughs> uh, Prabhu uh, is here on this call and he says in the chat, Bhakti is favorably, Bhakti is favorably serving God according to his desire and specifically free from karma and jnana. This is such a nice definition. He said that is free from sectarianism. Uh, Vrajvihari Prabhu is serving on Iskand Resolve. So he's he knows something about how to sort out uh, differences and uh, conflicts. Vrajvihari Prabhu, do you have a comment on today's uh, class? On yes, class? it was a really nice class. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tricky when sometimes it's our service to correct devotees, right? Like, like my wife, she's a temple president. And so, and so you sometimes you have to you do that as a service, but just as... Uh, uh, so how, how, do you, how do you correct her through like GBC or something? You have to go to, through Mayapur to correct her? <laughs> I don't even dare. Uh, but um, that's after 31 years of marriage. Um, but but I, I you know but I really like the point that uh, both Adi Prush Prabhu and Kishore Chandra Prabhu are making that it um, yeah we really have to kind of check our heart and also make sure that it's our service because sometimes we we like to just the mind like oh I like that person I don't like that person that person's really doing this wrong and the mind goes like that but is it really our service to um, either find fault with that person or to correct them? And if it is our service, then we really have to do it carefully. It's, it's, it's a burden of love to have that kind of service. The spiritual master has to do that. And, and it, um, I was talking to my son about this, and, and he's talking a lot about developing Vaishnava communities. And he feels that higher than being nice to everyone is being disruptive. And what he meant by that is that the relationships are so strong and so caring that you would go up, that the other person going back to God, it is as important as me going back to God. And so I will say, hey, you know, you're chanting your rounds lousy these days, but because the trust is so high, you can do that and the other person oh, it takes it in the right way. So that's, that's, a, that's kind of a, a high level of community building when you could actually do that without 
worrying about repercussions. But that's different than you know just criticizing for the sake of fault finding. So thank you for this wonderful class, Babu. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any further contributions to this class? Yeah, my personal takeaway is that when it comes to material dualities, I already posted them in the chat. When it comes to material things, we are all wrong. Yeah, yes. our God is right. Exactly, Scripture is right. And Kishore Chandra is right. We're all we're all a mess. <laughs> thank you, Kishore Chandra Prabhu, for putting that so concisely in a one-liner that I can grasp with my tiny brain. <laughs> Hemangi says, "Thank you so much." Kartik says. Thank you, Angel. Yeah, your heart is already stolen. That's it, Angel. Beautiful class. Yeah, thank you very much. It's 8.03. Kishore Chandra Prabhu, Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam, King of Books, Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Maybe, maybe everybody could turn their cameras on. Already, please. <laughs> ah, that's sweet. I can see. Bhima Prabhu is beaming. Yes, he through is. his beard. Hare Krishna, Bhima Prabhu. We like your hat. <laughs> Hemangi, Hare Krishna. Jamuna Jaya. <laughs> Olga, Olga. Hare Krishna. So good to see you. Thank you very much for this. This is so sweet. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. You're all wrong. Krishna is right. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Very well.